But I think the much stronger claim is that you cannot or you should not be able to hold a person liable personally for not moderating a software platform that is global. Because if you are to do that, then why are you stopping with the CEO of the company? Why not start with your entire government? Do you arrest police because they do not stop a crime? This episode is brought to you by Access Protocol. You'll be hearing more from them later in the show. This episode is sponsored by MyPrize, which is the first multiplayer casino where you can watch, chat, and play together with your friends. Use the referral code LIGHTSPEED when signing up to receive a 150% deposit bonus for up to $300. We'll hear more from MyPrize later in the episode. Hello and welcome back to another episode of Lightspeed. I'm Jack Kubinek, hosting alongside Mert Mumtaz. Mert, how you doing? Good, man. How you doing? I'm doing well. You're uh, you're calling from Korea, I believe. Yeah, uh, I'm in Busan, Korea. 10:40 a.m. here. This is yeah, 9:30 p.m. out here. Where uh, you know, we grind for the Lightspeed podcast. The people need their show, but. It um it's turning into the the Mert travel diary uh these days. It seems like there's a new location every show. Um Yeah. I've just been trying to get out of Canada in the fastest way possible. And yeah, I've been to like ten places almost, ten cities, maybe more in the past two months. Uh and I settled on Dubai actually. So I'll be moving to Dubai. Got the visa paperwork's in progress so hope to be there before the year ends i know there's a tiny prediction market around this so it's not up to me it's up to the paperwork gods yeah i <laughs> congratulations by the way um i had wanted to yeah i had wanted to ask about this cuz we we did a prediction market episode that um you weren't there for but but this came up and it's there's only 89% odds that you move out of canada but it seems like it seems like it's kind of uh, a done-ish deal, but I yeah, guess- I mean, it's. Uh, I think the market is if it's done by end of this year, which is the interesting part because I actually don't know the answer to that because I don't know how long the paperwork takes. Um, I mean, I'm going to be living in Dubai long before then, but there is this really bizarre policy in Canada where you get to you, you have to pay an exit tax, and the exit tax actually taxes you on un illiquid assets. And so so I have a startup, Helios. I have shares in startup and they're worth some money. And so from the seed stage of the company where the shares are worth basically zero dollars to the next funding round, obviously the valuation goes up quite a quite a bit after you start making money. And they make you pay a capital gains tax on that illiquid startup equity to exit the country. Bruh. Which is fucking crazy. I cannot even believe I have to, I, I, I said that out loud. Uh, so like that's like millions of dollars. So you can exit the country on money you do not have. <laughs> like yeah. it's so fucked. It's it's crazy to me that you have to pay an exit tax just in general. That's actually a new concept to me. Yeah, it's like you pay taxes your whole life while in that country, and then when you leave, they're like, okay, well you paid all your tax here, but just for one last time, pay us a lot of money. It's like, fuck you. Like I, yeah. it's, it's so bizarre. Yeah. And like, I feel like you have freedom of movement as like a fundamental human right. So to, I don't know, there's a, there's a city in Italy now, I forget which one, but it's one of these touristy cities where you have to pay to go in. It's like $10 to enter the city because it was too touristy and they just wanted to stop tourists from coming in. But this type of stuff is crazy, man. I, I yeah, I, I, you know, yeah, I, mean, I know everyone ever hates taxes, but they never cease to amaze. Yeah, like taxes are, you know, s- s- there's some weird tax policies for sure, but the exit tax on illiquid assets is just borderline crime in my view. Uh, I got so mad that I've been rereading the network state biology, and I'm like, you know. <laughs> Once I have a lot of money, I'm going to stay in a fucking country. This is insane. This is where your radicalization so, begins. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, anyway. well, congratulations. Um, there's a really cool aquarium in in Dubai and an indoor ski slope. I, I've um, I've heard I've been once. So I'm sure yeah. there will be be many good times uh, once you're there. Um, but but look, uh, 
we're we're back with a roundup episode um, this week. You know, obviously, the big item um, I want to kind of start with, Mert, is the uh, Pavel Durov arrest, um, founder and CEO of Telegram, father of over a hundred children. I don't know if you knew that. Um, <laughs> he nice. he, uh, he he posted about this in his Telegram um, channel. He's he's a big uh, big time sperm donor, but that's neither here nor there. Um, so over the weekend. Uh, this is from AP. Durov was detained in France as part of a judicial inquiry into 12 criminal violations, um, basically saying that he was complicit in selling child sexual abuse material, drug trafficking fraud, other crimes like that. Um, and then today, uh, we're recording this on Wednesday. Earlier today, the news came out this is from ABC um, that he had been charged in France with enabling various forms of criminality in the app. Um, and one of these charges, which is complicity in, uh, permiss- whatever, permitting illicit transactions carries a maximum penalty of 10 years in prison and a fine of 500,000 euros. Um, so looking like a very real chance that he is charged with a crime in France. Um, it, uh, yeah, you know, drew, um, immediate, uh, kind of, condemnation uh france's move on crypto twitter um mert what was your just kind of initial uh like take when when you saw that uh durav had been arrested i mean i was fired up i fired off at least 10 tweets relating to it it's it's just so wrong on so many levels that i'm kind of baffled that this is the state of europe like you could probably imagine something like this in like a place like China or something, but Europe or let's just the West in general. Uh, I mean, you know, like three weeks ago, the, the British government started arresting people for saying mean things on the internet. And a few weeks after this starts happening, I actually think this is potentially even worse. And let me kind of clarify my position on this. I, I think b- basically Telegram is, is a platform. It's a piece of software that lets people message each other. It's like a social media platform. There are some encrypted futures of it, although I don't think most people use those by default. Yeah, nobody, nobody uses them. Uh, yeah. You have to turn on secret messages. I learned this this week. Yeah, so it's, it's, you can maybe just think of it as a social media platform. Um, and the, the insane part of this to me is that he was charged personally as as in he was he's because like okay the the reason you set up a company or one of the reasons why companies exist is, or like llc's which is a limited liability corporation right like if if the company does something or doesn't do something that the government asks you do not personally arrest the ceo and call him a criminal okay it's it's, it's a company policy it's a company thing whatever you you deal with the company and so if this person doesn't take down content that is his own platform, and he does own the entire company, I believe, for me, at least when I last watched one of his interviews. And first of all, like, how, who are you to decide what content is good or what content is bad? It's a very slippery slope. And it's un, like, it's, it's, and everybody obviously has different laws around this over the world. And so it's it's a very difficult problem even for – even if you want to solve it on, on Telegram's end, it's a very difficult problem to solve. And so then you can say something like, okay, well, uh, can you guys do such and such? And you know, you maybe talk with the company back and forth for some court proceedings and all this. But you do not personally arrest the CEO – on 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 your soil and then make him a criminal because i mean look at it this way uh france has no shortage of crime okay <laughs> uh people will say lots of fucked up shit there obviously as in every country a lot of crime happens there probably even more than average i believe in france yet you do not jail the president because he did not control all of that crime or eliminate 100 percent of it and so that's and, and, and like, even just that, that's the part that I'm really annoyed by even just going in and like, if most people would probably go a little higher level than that and say, 
governments should not dictate what goes on platforms. You shouldn't need a license for cryptography. You should be able to say whatever you want, um, et cetera. It's just software. And so, but my position is, yes, I also agree with that. But I think the much stronger claim is that you cannot or you should not be able to hold a person liable personally for not moderating a software platform that is global. Uh, because if you are to do that, then why are you stopping with the CEO of the company? Why not start with your entire government? Do you arrest police because they do not stop a crime? Like it's uh, because they didn't have the means or something. It just, it makes no sense to me. And actually going back to the earlier Canada discussion, uh, what's interesting here is that uh, uh, he's also a Arab Emirates citizen. Uh, which I did not know because getting an Arab Emirates citizenship is extremely difficult. You need to be an extremely well-known person or, you know, a whatever, competent person. Yeah. yeah. And what, what's happened now, which didn't, which seemed like a rumor at the time, but I think it's been confirmed because it was on at least Al Jazeera, was that the Emirates actually paused an order of private jets uh, from France and they ordered, or at least they wrote a strongly worded letter to say like, hey, he needs all the counsel, give him all his rights and all this stuff, which I thought was just bizarre because Arab Emirates, you know, it's a monarchy. It's a religious monarchy. They do not believe in free speech. Um, most of the Arab countries don't. Yet they're telling the people who invented or, or, or built the Statue of Liberty and came up with liberty, equality, uh, fraternity that, hey, this is not right. And that's just fucking insane to me. Like, this all, and then, you know, that was a few weeks after that weird European person wrote a letter to uh, Elon Musk saying, hey, like, are you, like, you can't, uh, you know, he, he was basically uh, uh, saying, threatening something because Elon was having Trump on his uh, spaces. Like, the Europeans have completely fucking lost their minds, uh, at least at the, at the higher levels. I don't understand what's going on there, but as an entrepreneur or a founder... I would get out like today. Have you have you been to France recently? I have not. I've been to Brussels, which is just many France. Um, <laughs> I, I, like, there, I, mean, yeah. I can tell you, there's a fuckload of crime in Brussels. Uh, yet I don't no see any of these bureaucrats getting arrested. Yeah, I was I was in France and um, uh, in Paris in April a little bit, and and the the Fr- French people are mean stereotype is a little true, I must say. But um, sorry, off topic. But as as far as this conversation. Um, I, th- I really just have a lot of questions still. Um, I think knee jerk reaction. Um, you're not pleased to see somebody, uh, be like arrested over content that they're not directly responsible for that's on the platform they created, but there's a lot of weird details here. Um, Durov has a French passport. I don't know if you knew this. Um, yep. he's like written about it on telegram that he's a, a French citizen. Um, and there was an arrest warrant prior, so I'm confused why he went to France. Um, mm-hmm. I, I feel like uh, it, probably the behind-the-scenes stuff that will come out is that tele- um, the French authorities had been investigating crime that was happening on Telegram, which is which is widely known that like criminal activity does happen on Telegram. Um, it's not super hard to find, and Durov like failed to comply with that and and he has a history with that he was um uh left uh russia after founding like the russian equivalent to facebook because the government there wanted um him to like turn over user data and he refused to do it um so durov definitely has like a very libertarian ethos with this kind of thing um a lot of comparisons are being slung around i think maybe the closest one like off the top of my head is is uh Ross Ulbricht with um, Silk Road. Uh, although the difference there is that Silk Road was like a crime platform, um, whereas lots of people use Telegram for, you know, uh, tap to earn games, uh, farming airdrops and, and other such more harmless things. So, like, mm-hmm. although there is crime on Telegram, I don't feel like Telegram is a platform solely committed to crime and like by many accounts durov is very obsessed with the platform and the product and um 
yeah, very uninterested in moderation. Um, there also was weird stuff about he's being accused of using an illegal cryptography tool, sort of. But Telegram, again, like most people don't use encrypted messaging on it. So, um, I mean, I think that sentence alone is insane to me. Like an illegal cryptography tool yeah. is, is a wild concept because it's just it's just math. Like you're using equations by like hundreds of years, thousands of years old of, of, of just pure math, like numbers. And you're just multiplying numbers in some fashion. <laughs> and then you're, you're multiplying a message by it and then decoding. Like for that to be illegal, I, I, maybe I'm a, a bit on the libertarian side, but I think it is insane that you should, you can call that, anybody can call cryptography illegal. That, that that's, to me, that's insane. Um, so, and, and I've seen like weird conspiracy theories around this as well. Like apparently like Marcon, uh, 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 the French minister, apparently knows uh, uh, the CEO of Telegram and was, you know, is apparently a Telegram user himself uh, and, and like, yeah. random mm-hmm. things like that. And like, apparently, so I, I'm not going to go into those. Um, but then it gets interesting because uh, he's also a Russian citizen. And so it's, it's like a really interesting dynamic because it's he's a Russian born person who has citizenship in France and emirates and russia and he gets arrested in france but then the emirates aren't happy about that and russia isn't happy about that and like look the other part of this is i think i'm just super against jailing people for this like if you want to charge him for something and it's like hey that's going to be like a billion dollar fine it's like okay whatever money uh or, or or like you can't operate business in france or like you must shut down all your servers in france you can't use the app store here whatever like something like that, like there's just certainly avenues of, of punishment, but putting him in jail is fucked. Like I, like he's not murdering people. <laughs> like he's not doing, he's building software. Uh, and so anyway, I just, the, the concept of a jail for this is, is pretty Orwellian, I think. Yeah, that, that, that was for sure. What was chilling about it was that he was arrested um, right off the bat. It also just... I, I don't know what's the danger of Durov being free. He's not a a person that is um I don't know going to go and like facilitate more crimes. I I yeah. I, um it was strange. I'm sort of holding off just because there's so much um there's so much swirling around and I just um it's a really confusing story to me. I also just like I'm interested to see what sort of legal um like power France has in this matter. Like if, uh, Durov's a French citizen, I guess, obviously, and he's there, they can jail him. What, but like, what can they do to telegram? Um, I don't know. Also just like politically a really poisonous move for France to make. Um, definitely doesn't curry them favor in the world stage. Uh, telegram, um, has a lot of users. It's a very widely used messaging app. Um, uh, not just by crypto people, but um, by all sorts of people. So, so um, I mean, yeah. one of the chilling parts of this is I, I saw a few pieces of coverage on it, and there's a journalist who uh, was going over the French authority uh, reports in, in, in French, and uh, w- one of the things that I thought was fucked was that they were ha- well, the French authorities were happy about it, but they were also encouraging other European authorities to do the same uh to to like uh you know it's it's they politicize this to such an extent where it's like okay you must do this or you're allowing terrorism to happen or or something which is bizarre like no you're allowing terrorism to happen because it's in your soil right uh the, the, the jailing a founder because he wrote a piece of software that lets people message each other is not the way to stop that. The, the, the only way that's the, the only thing that's good for is to ensure that no founders actually ever want to take zero to one shots or start companies uh, in your own. And, and like each CC next year is in France, which like I actually just won't go. Uh, I actually liked each CC. It was in Brussels this year. Brussels kind of weird, but uh, I like I just I, it's I just cannot believe that. The Orwitz and Windows shifted so much that you can get jailed for this. I'm 
curious to see where things go. I, I guess I'm curious, like maybe to put it, um, to 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 draw out of this, like, you know, c- crimes do happen on Telegram, and it, it's like a a real thing. Um, I guess in the sort of like permissionless Web three world, does content moderation, um, for like things that are illegal, uh, so like narcotics trafficking, um you know, inappropriate material involving children. Like th- th- where, where does content moder like, like who does content moderation fall on, I guess. And like who ultimately bears responsibility for that kind of material? Well, the, the, the answer is something like email where there's a decentralized and permissionless protocol underneath that powers it. So like even with the internet, like networking protocols or email protocols or web protocols. And then there's clients that are built on top of those protocols. And depending on the legal structure of those pro- uh, clients, then, you know, I mean, if you are incorporated in France and you want, and the French government requires you to do certain things to surface that app in that jurisdiction as a client team, then you do have to obey those laws, uh, especially if you have the power to do it. Um, But if you don't obey those laws, uh, then it should be the company that gets charged, not the CEO should be jailed, right? Uh, That's kind of how I look at it. And I think Telegram already does do this, like Apple and Android, obviously, for, for you to distribute on their platforms or app stores. You need to play by their rules. You need to pay some sort of revenue to them. You need to ensure that certain things are happening and certain things are not happening. And Telegram does follow those. And so it's like, okay, which jurisdiction takes place here? And so they're not like, I don't think they're easy legal considerations. Um, But fundamentally what I'm against, and so like, like that's kind of the point of decentralized protocols, by the way is that the underlying protocol itself is decentralized, but the things on top of it obviously don't have to be decentralized. And if they're not, then they have to obey by certain laws. Um, and, and so that's like a n- complex, nuanced uh, topic, especially because the regularity on it isn't super clear in the case of crypto. Like today, they uh, SEC started coming after OpenSea four years after OpenSea stopped being a thing uh, for alleging that they're selling securities uh, on, on the platform. And so like that is to say, there's definitely a lot of legal ambiguity, but the, the point I want to make that, that I, I think should be super clear on my part is that yeah, absolutely not. Can you, you, you definitely should not be able to jail the CEO of the company because he did not, because the company did not do something, uh, mm-hmm. unless the company is literally arming like rebels or something. Even in which case, those companies don't even get, like, the CEOs don't get jailed. Uh, th- this is just an insane policy to me. Yeah, it is. Um, yeah, because because I, I, I do think, like, um, we don't know the extent exactly, like, of uh, what sorts of things France is looking into. Like, there are instances of Telegram um, doing some sort of, like, content moderation and, and taking down certain... Um, groups like one of telegram's big features is you can have like massive groups which uh, other messaging apps don't let you do um and so they've like gotten involved with that a little bit but probably not nearly to the extent of like a facebook for instance um you know but i do think like you have to grapple at some point with if there are like illegal like if there's crimes being committed on telegram um and you have the ability to kick people off the platform like the the you know that be that maybe becomes telegram's responsibility at a certain point but i i do like hear you that um it to take the founder and and imprison him is um yeah that it's it's uh like kind of sets a scary precedent um but anyways uh um we'll be you know monitoring this i'm i'm sure it'll come up again um as he's now sort of going to go to court and, uh, in what I'm sure will be, you know, probably, I think it's going to be a really big story, like certainly bigger than tornado cash, 
uh, the Tornado Cash developers trial. Um, I think Durov got a lot of mainstream press as well. And I think this is a story that's going to be very widely followed. And I think a lot, like there's a pretty broad sentiment ish, uh, that, that like, um, like not a cool move on France's part. So, um, mm-hmm. we'll be interesting to see how, how this unfolds. Fragmentation is a big problem for Ethereum, but also for the subscription industry. We all know the pain of tracking which subscriptions you're paying for and the hassle of trying to cancel them. Well, Access Protocol is here to help with a new way to consume content via staking. It's built on Solana and gives you an easy solution to stay up to date on what's happening in the industry by giving you access to your favorite publishers like CoinGecko, CryptoSlate, and a whole list of independent creators. The ACS token, that's the access token, is staked to gain access to all of that creator's content without the hassle of managing a subscription. If you want to give it a try, check out the link in the show notes to claim a free NFT that gives you access to a creator's content. My Prize is the first multiplayer casino where you can watch, chat, and play together with your friends. With over 500 games ranging from slots to live table games to the latest online casino favorites, there's something for everyone. Crypto is at the core of my prize, so you can play it anytime, anywhere. Get your friends, hop into your favorite creator's room, and see why winning is better together. Use the referral code LIGHTSPEED when signing up to receive a 150% deposit bonus up to $300. Thanks again to my prize for sponsoring today's episode. Second thing I wanted to get into with you, Mert. Um, this week, there was Ethereum controversy, uh, surprisingly. Um, basically, uh, Kane Warwick, um, Ethereum, DeFi, OG, um, tweeted sort of this cryptic post that, um, you know, Vitalik, um, co-founder of Ethereum, only begrudgingly tolerates DeFi, even though most of the activity on Ethereum is DeFi. Um, and then... Um, like a couple weeks later, he goes on a podcast and much more clearly is like, yeah, um, Vitalik sort of, uh, you know, holds his nose towards DeFi, but um, he needs to be supporting the thing that's driving most of the activity on the chain, which I guess is DeFi. Um, concurrently, uh, at some point, I don't want to get too much into the Twitter drama, but it comes out that Ethereum, the Ethereum Foundation has a $100 million annual budget. And um, a lot of anonymous accounts, as they love to do, were um, sort of tweeting about this, saying it, it speaks to a lack of um, uh, like transparency on the part of the Ethereum Foundation. Uh, Evan SS Six, the guy with the like um, the the like dude, uh, you know, a very evocative profile picture, um, tweeted uh, at this point it's very unclear what Ethereum, like basically saying nobody really cares about the $100 million thing, but they're looking for something to complain about because at this point, it's very unclear what Ethereum's narrative is. Is it sound money or tech? And what value to ascribe to that? Wall Street seems quite confused already one month in, referencing the ETH ETFs, which have so far not been um, nearly as as you know big a source of inflows as Bitcoin ETFs were, which I thought was, um, you know... Uh, a good point um, from a, a kind of unhinged poster at points. Um, all of this, uh, you know, continues to um, boil boil up a little bit, and then finally, Vitalik uh, responds to one of the tweets, basically saying, "Like, there's quite a few things I like in Ethereum, um, and you know, I do like DeFi. However, um, I'm not really into like yield farming or these like." Um, sort like fly by night protocols that promise some kind of unsustainable yield and then disappear. Um, Mert, you, I, I uh, dredged up a tweet from you. You said finance is downstream of a functioning economy of goods and services. You were sort of defending Vitalik, from what I understand. But, but yeah, what was your take on this whole situation? There's there's quite a few points there. I think I'll start with the simplest one, which is that the Ethereum Foundation spending outcry, I think, was really stupid. $100 million for a foundation as big as Ethereum, which is like a $300 billion market cap asset, is nothing. It's less than 0.003% of 
that. And those people help Ethereum uh, through research, uh, advocacy, uh, and uh, employment, et cetera. There's a bunch of different things they do. And so a lot of people on CT have never done business in any way, so they can't relate, I guess. But that's not a bad amount. Uh, and so I, I, and then, you know, then the argument is like, okay, should there be more transparency about it? Uh, uh, perhaps, I mean, they don't owe it to the people. Uh, you know, it's not like they have this legal obligation to do it. If they want to do it, they can do it. Um, but then, you know, their, their position on this, if I were to guess, is probably something like people on Twitter are crazy and they'll take everything out of context, which seems correct. And so I don't think Ethereum foundation spending is a big deal in any way. Uh, I think it's it's a well-run foundation, all things considered. Okay, now the second part, the the DeFi comment. Uh, yeah, so uh, Chain, obviously uh, known as the grandfather of agriculture because he basically invented yield farming. Um, I think super talented founder, entrepreneur, uh, great thinker. Um, and then obviously Vitalik needs no introduction. I also thought it was interesting because Andre from Phantom, who obviously invented Curve, also had a post on it, which argues that, you know, finance is kind of the oldest thing and it's the most important thing for an economy because ever since, <clears throat> ever since like the bartering system of like, you know, you have some corn, I have some wheat, we need to trade them. Here's an IOU, et cetera. Um, and then obviously, uh, let's say you want to take out a loan from a bank and you want to start new business ventures and stuff. There's kind of the income you earn on the interest, and that's a like pure income. It's solely for uh, the opportunity cost of capital, and and so I, I think like that's. I think he actually had a pretty good post on it, which sort of helped change my mind a little bit. But I think the fundamental point still stands. Um, even in Andre's example of where you need, like finance, actually is a self-sustaining thing where it's like the most important part of an economy. Even in that example, you are trading things that have real value. Uh, and, 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 and so like corn, wheat, whatever, these are things in the physical world that are scarce in some regards, scarce. Um, and you can use them to build other things or consume them to survive, right? It's all this stuff. And so then the question becomes, okay, what, what is kind of the purpose of DeFi, right? Is it to help take these assets that are in the existing world and put them on crypto rails to make them easier to trade and more efficient. You know, like you tokenize certain uh, assets or commodities or all these things, or maybe even securities, synthetic assets. And then now it's um, you can do it much more effectively with crypto without all these permissioned um, systems kind of barring access and reducing economic freedom in a sense. So that's one side of it. And then the other side of it is, like, okay, do these things have to be crypto native economies? Meaning that does the economy need to exist in crypto such that the income is generated on the blockchain first? Uh, and then if it is, where is that yield coming from, right? Like you see something like, okay, well, there's 800% APY on this AMM. It's like, first of all, that needs to die. Uh, that always comes from like weird incentives or inflation or some bizarre thing. And I think that's the point that he's tackling. Um, I think he's because he also basically gives credit to stables and RWAs, I think, um, and, and like how, how they've been useful. And I agree. I think payments and, and stables and RWAs in general are a good idea and showcase the usefulness of it. But then there's other things that are like just like let, let's let's not kind of troll ourselves here. There's absolutely an insane amount of circle jerk economies in crypto. Uh Half of the industry revolves around people buying something early and then trying to convince others to buy them at a later price because they must do it because like, that's just a, that's just a, that's a Ponzi. I, it is a Ponzi. Uh, I don't really give a shit what people say. Like you can say something like, Oh, well, but there are stables. Like, Oh yeah, there are stables. There are other things that are useful, but this specific thing is obviously a circle jerk. Right. And so you don't want to blur these lines and then make fallacious arguments using irrelevant evidence. Um, the reality is there are a lot of circular economies, uh, and he probably thinks that that makes up the majority of activity or, or too much of it that, and he obviously doesn't like that. And I also don't like that. I mean, who would like that? Uh, I don't quite understand, uh, other than maybe just, and then people will say something like, you know, 
well, speculation uh, is, is a real thing and you can make money off speculation. It's like, that's true. Okay, sure. <laughs> um, and and I, like, I think that's fine. It's not particularly inspiring to me. And so I don't care about it, but you go do whatever. Um, I, I think the much broader point here is that I think Vitalik's point is nuanced and mostly correct. I also think Kane is mostly correct. I, I don't think any of these people are wrong because they're all saying things that are true, but they don't necessarily tackle each other's arguments. Um, I think Kane's saying like, well, Vitalik should support DeFi more. Um, and as a DeFi founder, he's correct. He obviously would like that and all DeFi founders would benefit from it. Vitalik saying, well, it's not really in my personal values to support this part of DeFi, although I do like this part of DeFi, which is also correct and fair. And then Andre says, like, well, DeFi is necessary and super important because it allows for this and this. That's also true. Like none of these are actually, if you if you zoom out, they're not actually conflicting with each other too much. Um, but I think the the problem, and this is where the ETF stuff kind of comes into play. I think the much broader problem and the much more concerning problem to me is how oversensitive people have gotten in on CT due to these short-term discussions. Like people think literally everything is an attack against Ethereum. Uh, I believe Bankless had on Kyle Samani on the podcast and people went insane. They were like, oh, why are you having this person spread lies on it? It's like, he's not spreading lies. He's sitting his opinions. You might disagree with those opinions and you're more than welcome to dispel them and provide a rational counter argument and say, this is false. Or you can say, no, no, no. Bankless is an enemy against Ethereum. They suck. They should be deplatformed. Do not have these people on the po podcast. And that's the latter is what, uh, an alarming number of the community members have taken. And that's a super large turnoff for anybody serious about building anything, right? You do not want to, the, the only, you know, the ideology of, hey, do not have opposing viewpoints here so that our community does not get exposed to these viewpoints because they're saying lies, but we're saying truth. That's religion. That's not discourse. That's not how technology or business works. And that is what's happening. And it's then you kind of combine this with, well, Ethereum Foundation is selling Ethereum and therefore our bags are going down. Or, you know, why are our bags going down? It's like, okay, um, your your bags are going down, I understand. But the, the counter to this is not to just blame literally everything that can be blamed. The counter is to think hard and build things that create value or at least facilitate value more efficiently, just build something, do something. Or if you're not going to do that, provide rational counter arguments so that people can have meaningful discussions. Instead, what's happened is people are calling Anatoly a scammer, which is like, how did that even, because Anatoly thinks economic security is a meme, uh, that's his opinion. It can't be a lie. So no, it's an opinion. Uh, you might disagree with him and you can, if you're correct, then go prove him wrong. Uh, go say, hey, your opinion is wrong because of such and such. But if you're calling him a liar and a fraud and a scammer or whatever, which, by the way, people start doing that. And I noticed something much more alarming, which is Vitalik was like, oh, yeah, this is a good post. And then he'll, like, say other stuff. And it's like, what the fuck do you mean it's a good post? Or like Vance from Framework. I saw somebody tweet about the bank listing today. And it's like, this is a very thoughtful take. I'm like, what the fuck do you mean this is a thoughtful take? They're calling people that don't disagree with that, don't agree with them, scammers or liars. It's like, it's. For a, for a technology that's supposed to tackle the tyranny of shit that we just discussed, like telegrams, like like censorship resistance and stuff, it's in, insane to me that people are resorting to tyrannical means to suppress the things that they don't like. It's like there's only one thing that's worked for science, which is the enlightenment. It's the conjecture of ideas, criticism of ideas, testability of ideas, iterating them, debating them, free markets. So that sort of stuff. That's clearly works. That's why the West has succeeded to the extent that it has. And now everybody is just doing this weird CT game where it's like, oh, like you're a scammer. What? Like, it's just so. I'm like, a, you know, people know me as like a Twitter, let's say, uh, a reply guy or like warrior. I'm actually kind of sick of it at this point because these arguments are not actually. They're all in bad faith. Nobody's actually even trying to steal man the other counter positions. Uh, aside in any way and so anyway rant over uh, I think people just get weird when they look at price stop looking at the fucking price <laughs> just just build things 
or try to be useful, try to provide value, write a podcast or, or make a podcast, write a newsletter, do something, but don't just sit on your chair in your basement, eat your Cheetos and call other people scammers because you can't do shit. <laughs> Prediction market voters for uh, Will Mert bring up the enlightenment. Going to be very happy after this one comes out. <laughs> but uh, but no, I yeah I I feel similarly about Twitter. I think there's um, you have to make your peace with it because like it's just where crypto Web three stuff happens, and there's no escaping it. But I I do think it um, captures like a chronically online subset of people that aren't representative of of everyone who uses crypto. And I think when you take the the debate's too seriously. You get a kind of skewed view of the world. But um, yeah, I mean, my sort of cynical take on it is just that it, it, a lot of it comes down to price. And um, Ethereum has traded really sideways for like years now. And, um, you know, if I was holding a lot of, uh, of Ethereum and um, with the thought that it's going to go up so much in value, I'd be a little bit grumpy too. Um, and like, I get it. And I, I think a lot of um, people in the Ethereum world want Vitalik to be like a Richard Hart or like a Trump for <laughs> their blockchain. And like, that's just not really Vitalik's um, temperament. He's uh, kind of a nerdy guy who's very thoughtful and um, likes to write these like 10,000 word blog posts about things. And he's not going to be out like shilling. Um, DeFi or like the latest uh, thing that's driving TVL to Ethereum or whatever. Um, it's just not the way he is. Um, and I think like people in the Ethereum world should probably come to grips with that. I guess my one other thought from from um, what you were saying, Mert, is like I didn't read Andre's post on finance, but I just I I kind of liked your tweet with like you know, you need DeFi to be downstream of like a useful economy. Um, and in the real world, like the the good that finance kind of does in the world, to my understanding, is it enables you to do tangible things you'd never be able to do without finance, like uh, buy a home. <laughs> like most people would never be able to do that if we didn't kind of have the tools of finance or, you know, take out a loan to start a business or things like that. Um and I think it's you know a little bit of a cop out to make it seem like well DeFi um, is just inherently good because it is finance. But if it's finance that's kind of uh, generating like this unsustainable yield and uh, you know eventually is uh, going going to collapse to zero once enough people join, like I don't know, I, I'm not as sold. Um, yeah, but- I mean it's. The, the, it has to be certainly finance has to be downstream of some productive economy. It's unclear if that economy needs to be the real world or crypto native or a mix of both. The problem with when you make it the real world is the point of decentralized DeFi is decentralized finance, and the things that you're downstream of in the real world are not going to be decentralized. And so then it's like you know a system let's say is only as decentralized as its most centralized component. And so, for example, in the, in the case of stables, now it's better. More people have access to the US dollar through USDC, and you can transact it much better. Uh, but USDC is centrally controlled by Circle; they can just freeze it. And so, in that sense, it's actually a purely technological improvement in terms of rails and efficiency, and not necessarily a crypto-specific improvement in the values that we associate with crypto, which is like security, centralization, central resistance. Um, and so I think something that people fail to understand is that crypto is not only good for decentralization. That's one property of it. But the aspect that I've always found much more fascinating, uh, and I've tweeted about this quite a few times, is globally shared state, right? Like if you want to access, let's say, the APIs for a bank in, uh, I don't know, Zimbabwe or something, uh, today that's going to be pretty fucking difficult. They probably don't even have it. Uh or and then now you have to compose with you know uh, uh, Estonia, Russia, Iran, all this stuff, and their sanctions and all that stuff. But with crypto, you have a global ledger, and the global ledger allows developers more freedom to build other things and give more access to other people. And obviously, that relies on the blockchain itself being decentralized and secure and all that. But uh, the, the like the final product that's 
uh, built. So like the, the client analogy, like there's the blockchain is a protocol, but if there's a client team that's still doing something with that block space that is not decentralized, that's still okay because it might still help improve that business. Uh, and so those are like kind of difficult questions and, um, it should be thought about pretty carefully, but, uh, certainly we're not going to get there if the discourse has degraded to a point where it's like, Hey, you had the founder of another L1 on your podcast. Therefore you are an enemy to the state. Um, which is like just fucking crazy. Like, I don't understand how people think this way. Uh, I, I get happy. When, like if, if you're going to bring somebody on, let's say Lightspeed or, or, uh, my replies or whatever, if they say something that's like a position that I don't agree with, I get happy because I'm like, okay, I can prove this wrong. I don't say nobody should hear this. Uh, like it's, it's just such a silly thing. Like if your position, if you felt confident in your position, your logic and your rationality, then why are you so scared of other people hearing the other point? <laughs> right? Like it makes no sense. Uh, and, and so w w one thing that needs to happen for sure is that people need to get less sensitive uh, around crypto discourse. Like people just call literally every, I think this is the worst part of crypto, which is, or, or one of the most underrated reasons for why crypto progress is stagnated in a sense is the absolutely brain damaged rebrand of valid criticism to FUD. Like criticism is not FUD, criticism is criticism. FUD might be like, maybe you might say unsubstantiated criticism with no backing or rationality behind it. Uh, and, and certainly there's cases of that. But rebranding everything that's valid to FUD is a great way to weaponize or like politicize issues that should not be politicized. Like if somebody somebody replied to uh, one of my one of Bankless's posts saying like, "Oh, these guys are still like floating around the old lie that, or the midwit lie or something that you can scale the L1 without sacrificing decentralization." It's like, sorry, wh where exactly did you get your engineering degree to know that? all possible set of transformations for an engineering system. It's like, you can't make that claim. You can't prove it. Like prove it if, if like Vitalik's triangle blog post from 10 years ago about the blockchain trilemma is not a sufficient enough reason, right? It's a very simple uh, thought experiment. You have a blockchain system. Let's say it does everything sequentially. Okay, now let's say you change the code such that it does a parallel. Okay, you just improved throughput by quite a bit. You do not change the decentralization at all, yet the it, L1 scaled better. There's a ton of systems and code loops and inefficient parts of code bases like this in all software systems. And you can absolutely optimize the living shit out of them to get much more performance out of that system. And only engineers know this. Only engineers who have actually worked on it who can actually like with firsthand know it. People can obviously secondhand know it because they trust engineers and stuff. Uh, but what you can't have are people who have fucking angel investment bags or something who, who just say, hey, this is not the right way to do engineering. It's like, dude, you've never written a lot of code. Like, wh why are you commenting on the only way to scale something? You might say, this is the way I prefer scaling. That's fine. You cannot say this is the only way to scale in a, in, in a fundamentally scientific endeavor, which is technology, which is applied science, right? Uh, I just, it's, it's all so tiresome. Yeah. I just don't get it. When I, when I hear the term FUD, like, alarm bells go off for me because it just uh no good conversation happens after that and um it, you know maybe there's good reasons to be uh fudding whatever whatever the thing is that the people are talking about but um okay uh we're 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 quite a few minutes in and listeners are gonna get pissed if we don't speak you know specifically to the solana world um there's not a whole ton going on uh magic eden did sort of announce its token and um it's expanding beyond NF nfts it's doing like a pump fun ish thing for nfts that'll be interesting to watch but um i guess what i want to talk to you maybe in this final section mert is uh we'll just headline like solana's next narrative um is something i've been thinking about a bit this week um so two like major talking points for solana in recent months have been um, ETFs and meme coins. So uh, you had Van Eck and 21 shares file for ETFs. We had uh, Matthew Siegel on for a good good episode talking about this. Um, shortly after we did that episode with him, SIBO, the exchange where these ETFs were proposed to be listed, 
pulled the 19B4s, which are an application that uh, needs to be approved for these ETFs to actually trade. Um, the block reported that this was because the SEC sort of privately reiterated that it believes Solana is a security and could not have an ETF as a result. Um, so it seems like at least for now, there's not going to be uh, Solana ETFs in the near future. Because just at least my understanding is that you need these 19 B4s to be filed for like pressure to be on the SEC to make a decision. But now there's not really pressure on the SEC to make any sort of decision. Um, you're probably at least kicking the can down the road till after the presidential election, at the least. Secondly, meme coins. Um, I don't want to overstate the uh, like quote unquote fall of meme coins because um, I think they're still like they've lasted long enough that it's not just a flash in the pan type of trend and platforms like Pump Fun still do a lot of revenue, even if the revenue is lower, but the revenue is lower. And, um, you know, a lot of popular meme coins have seen lower volumes. Uh, Pump Fun is collecting fewer fees. And it seems like um, just vibes wise, uh, people are starting to get a little annoyed with um, the kind of like top heavy, uh, you know, way that whales tend to do okay and everyone else um, loses a lot of money on these platforms. So <laughs> that's where we stand. Um, I've been told, like for an article I was doing, someone said, well, you know, Breakpoint, uh, Solana Breakpoint is around the corner, big conference. Last year, this catalyzed a new narrative. Um, Mert, what do you think? Mm -hmm. Is, is uh, I guess I'll start with like a, do you see a clear next narrative that Solana is going to graft onto? And, and B, do you think that's going to come out of Breakpoint? I think the narrative for Solana is sort of, for me, it's always been the same. I, I understand that people also have feelings about the ETF and, and meme coins and stuff, but I don't necessarily consider those things as the narrative. I, I, generally don't give a shit if an ETF gets approved or when it gets approved. Uh, if it does, great. Uh, but I think fundamentally the most important thing always is building businesses on top of these rails that actually create value and improves things. Okay, that's the only thing that matters. Um, and I think that's always a narrative with Solana. So uh, for some examples, uh, we just released DK Compression, which reduces the cost of building on chain as a Solana developer by 5,000x. So you can start experimenting with new token models, new account structures. You can build more things uh, for consumers or businesses or whatever kind of business model you have. You can just build more things and build uh, startups and companies on top of it. Along with that, there's obviously a new Solana radar hackathon. And Solana hackathons are probably the best run hackathons I've seen in any software system or technology. They generally pump out quite a few startups that get venture funding. So like Drift, Jito, uh, Zeta. A bunch of like um, uh, even some of the wallets, et cetera, squads, uh, those all come from the Solana hackathons. And so they're basically like global startup competitions. And with, with things like ZK compression, uh, but also like um, uh, th there's an accelerator, Solana Labs accelerator, there is Solana Mobile, um, and the cost of building things is going down. Fire Dancer is coming, which will help scale the chain and give app developers a better, better experience. And I, I think the fundamental narrative always kind of is the same, which is that if you want to build a business, if you want to do startups, if you want to build things, then you come to Solana because it's just the best place to do it. The friction is the lowest. Uh, there's no social complexity uh, as far as, you know, like what part of the stack do I use for what part of the sequencer or something that just doesn't exist. Now, if you want to do that, go ahead. Sure. Those options are there. But Solana is just super simple. If you're just like, hey, I want to make a payments app in, in uh, Denmark and I want people to be able to pay fast or, or micro tip people uh, or I want to put this thing on chain, you can just do that on Solana. That's the, in my view, that's the entire ethos of what, what, what or, or the narrative. Now, those businesses might take different forms. Like it might be pumped out fun with meme coins which, you know, I, you, you might have uh, questionable, uh, uh, you might have moral questions about meme coins, let's say, but you can't deny that Pump that Fund makes an insane amount of money and they're a good business, right? Like they have made money, they have great margins. Uh, it's, it clearly works, right? Phantom started on Solana, Magic Eden started on Solana. 
Uh, Helios started on Solana and we're Solana only. There's a lot of great businesses that are built on Solana with great venture backing. And so I think, you know, to, and there's also Deepin, right? Like HiMapper, Helium, these are all kind of pretty gigantic companies at great scale. Um, and that just needs to be the focus. The only focus should be how do we get startups or businesses to build things uh, on chain? And we think that Solana is the best place to do that. It's not the only place. Uh, you might have cases where you require like custom block space or something for like a game, uh, in which case there's magic block now on Solana, which solves that. But maybe you want a different, I don't know, characteristic for security or something. Then, you know, use Celestia, use something else. But for the vast majority of cases, I think you can just come to Solana, build things, and uh, actually focus on the important parts, which is not semantic circle joke debates on Twitter, but uh, uh, acquiring customers and, and creating things for customers that actually help them. Yeah. I, I mean, like, yeah, I, I uh, <laughs> talk quite a bit about how meme coins are, are just a major driver of activity and stuff. And I, I don't want to like over... Um, I feel like I'm like a little bit of a contrarian pump fund defender. Um, I think if you're like seriously dumping lots of money into the platform, like you need to seek God, but it's it it's like a cool platform. Like what they did is innovative and it was a thing you couldn't do before. Um, and like, I, I, I can think of other applications for sort of what pump fund did. Um, of like, hey, you can create a crypto token really easily for basically no money um, and sort of spread these like memes and things. Like, do I love everything about the way Pump Fund carries it out? No, but like, it's a good business. It generates a lot of revenue. I think people also sleep on how Pump Fund is like immune to criticism or it like leans into criticism a lot. I think Solana in general does this a good bit, but like... um. Pump Fund will take like, oh, we got hacked or whatever uh, by by that rogue employee. And it doesn't really seem to affect them like other protocols might be affected. They they just kind of like um, laugh at it on Twitter and continue to be the platform um, where meme yeah. coins happen. I also think all of these derivatives, the, the Tron one uh, or like the several that are on Solana that are kind of trying to be pump fun none of them have worked and that says something too so i don't <laughs> i uh i want to i, I mean, want to say on the record that like there's good things about pump fun for sure yeah i mean uh even beyond good or bad it, it like it clearly is a good business um I, so and then you know people make moral judgments about it but then like base is like literally incentivizing memes or like mm -hmm. other chains are always trying to do pump but on their chain and it's just or like my favorite example was like somebody posted uh, Solana or like Pump has extracted this amount of value from people, um, and they just cite the revenue numbers. Uh, but when Uniswap does it, it's just revenue. It's just good old fashioned revenue. It's not extracting anything. It's just such bullshit. Uh, like such double standards in in the messaging. I mean, look, nobody's forcing people to use Pump that fun, right? It's not like there's some legal, corporate law or government laws that you must use this platform and pay us. It's like people have a need to. Or, or demand to launch tokens or something. And then there's other people who want to buy them. And there's other people who want to uh, do downstream things about like Telegram bots. And they're just using a tool to do it. And there's a tool that facilitates it and makes money off of it. That's all there is to it. That's what a business is. There's a gap in the market. You address that gap. You sell it for more than it costs you. You make money. <laughs> that's like, that's, that is fundamentally the same as any other business. Um, so like spare me these weird moral things on, on CT, uh, if you don't like them, don't use them. Uh, but you know, it's, it's not like people were saying this about open C, uh, back in the day when NFTs were doing the exact same thing. Uh, and so it's just like this weird, insecure bag fighting messaging stuff is just so weird to me. Uh, like yeah. fundamentally we care about businesses, uh, that work. Uh, now you might say, okay, well, meme coins are not going to last therefore pump will die out. Is it okay? Maybe. Sure. Uh, that could happen. Uh, they're not going to sit on their ass and, 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 you know, wait for that to happen. They'll probably uh, uh, try to innovate on, on some other dimensions or try to, you know, whatever, get more customers. Um, but that's the same with any business. <laughs> Nothing is ever guaranteed for any business. They can all start losing customers. They can all start being unsustainable. And that happens all the time. I think like the lifespan of a company in the S&P is like, you know, 10 years max or something. Like this happens all the time. Uh, and so I don't understand why crypto people are so just ignorant of how business works. Yeah. 
I say this all the time, but like businesses don't need to last forever. That's not the point of them. They make money for a time. But um, I do like want to push back a little, Mert, uh, or or um, ask you to expand because you know you bring up things like tech, like Fire Dancer, ZK Compression, um, but like don't narrative like so for myself who's not technical, like don't narratives matter a bit just for Solana's ability to continue to draw new investors and therefore users for all of the stuff that the tech is built on. Like I, I do think that in a world where ETFs, which are like an easily digestible thing and um you know are are, not, are off the table and meme coins are passe. They they like go the way of NFTs. Like that 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 could be a problem, right? Like you you need to find a pivot of of for casual users who are, you know, buying and selling soul and who will be users for the new products that people are building. Like you need an, a narrative, right? Isn't there value to that? Uh, well, I've been called the chief narrative officer of Solana quite, quite a few <laughs> times. Um, and my stance on it is that it really it depends by who you mean by you. Like when you say you need a narrative, like who, who is it that needs a narrative? Is it the L1? Is it the teams on top of the L1? Uh, is it the investors of the L1? So I think that's important. Um, and I think most discussions are centered around the investors of the L1 need a narrative so that their token price doesn't go down. Uh, but once you have businesses building on top of the thing, like Pump Dot Fun or Magic Eden or, or Phantom uh, or, or Helium or HiMapper or Drip, once you have these things, they get users. And then when they get users, there's activity on chain. And that activity then drives, let's say, metrics for the L1. Like, okay, this is the amount of economic activity, right? Blockworks released a new dashboard about uh, economic activity, MEV, fees, all this stuff. Um, and then you can kind of, you know, obviously use those to maybe form some sort of a narrative like, hey, we're the best chain for Deepin, or hey, this is the best chain for consumers. Uh, but fundamentally, the narrative is downstream of the thing actually working. Uh, right. And so I, I don't think, I think, you know, um, in, in terms of narrative, it's just simplicity. Uh, Solana just works and you don't need all these other components or layered architecture to make it work or to start on it or to bridge or to do anything. Uh, you can just go on the all one and you can get a wallet and everything works. Uh, and then sometimes it doesn't, you know, fail, uh, let's say, uh, congestion and stuff and we fix those. Uh, and that's the only way, I mean, there's no other way. Like we, we, we can, um, I, I don't think it's, so I came up with only possible on Solana because I was sick of people, um, I copying apps copy from that? the EVM. Yes. I didn't know that. Um, I, I, uh, and, and, uh, the reason is cause I was sick of people copying and pasting Ethereum applications, but on Solana, it's like, you're not really doing anything interesting here. You can be vampire attacked. You can, somebody can kind of just take, take it and, and, and go to another chain with it. But, but Solana gives you like an inherent moat where you have instant cons composability, pretty low, uh, uh, latency, uh, still pretty good security, like probably the best security after Ethereum in, in decentralization as well, while also giving you performance. And obviously there's limits to all of those things, but it's kind of the best thing that we have today. And I think like f fundamentally the thing that keeps me awake at night all the time is that there's not enough businesses building on top of these things to build cool things. Like with AI, it's totally different. With AI, there's a, a bunch of businesses that already change how everything works. Like I started using Claude or uh, Cursor.ai to do my own work, and it instantly makes an improvement in my life by like 10x. With crypto, that hasn't really been the case. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that that needs to be... It's, it's a harder problem, and it's not like a buzz line, buzzwordy thing, but it, it needs to just be startups, businesses on chain because fast, cheap, easy. Yeah. Yeah. And I can, and I, yeah, I can definitely appreciate like this focus on just build things that work. But, um, in the meantime, I think, uh, lately, and, and I tweeted about this, but there's maybe less interest in like crypto is maybe less interested in explaining itself than it was, um, a couple of years ago. And I think that it's like helpful to continue to say like, Hey, right now, you know, we don't have a ton of apps that um, have a lot of users, or like payments haven't taken off in a real way. But here's what we can build. Here's like why this will be helpful down the line. I think continuing to have that north star and have a narrative that's easily digestible for your 
retail or community to the extent that like quote unquote community matters. Um, I, I want to see more of that. Um, but, but again, like, yes, obviously at the end of the day, what matters is, uh, do people build sustainable businesses with all of the tech that's coming out? Um, well, I mean, yeah. you can tell better stories once there's better material. Mm -hmm. um, but otherwise, it's just a game of stories, which is why you see CT being the dominant, let's say, playground for crypto. It's because it's a place you can tell stories. Um, and people just, it's always narrative versus narrative or story versus story. Uh, but the story becomes quite stronger when you have real things backing it up. And so uh, definitely, you know, neither should be neglected, but I think... You, you need David Ogilvy has this thing, uh, like the father of advertising. It's like, tell the truth, but make the truth fascinating. Um, and, and today the truth is that the apps aren't there. And so we can't make it fascinating. We can otherwise kind of a lie. And so we need to first create the truth with like, Hey, this does work in such and such ways. And then I think the narrative becomes much easier. Hmm. Well, well, look, Mert, we've been going for quite some time and you need to get back to making truth and I need to get to sleep. It's uh, it's late here, but uh, but no, it's been it's been a good time. Um, had some fiery moments, had some some uh, moments of good dialogue. It's fun as always. Uh, we have lots of good episodes coming up. Stay tuned. And uh, yeah, Mert, I'll uh, I'll see you next week. It's been good. All right. Thank you.